Hi, I'm Shaq Youssef and my role at SDI Media is Access Services Support for Europe. Shaq, what are Access Services exactly in a multinational like SDI Media? Access Services encompasses a few different services, so to speak, and they mainly help people who are less capable to enjoy entertainment of different forms. So Access Services covers subtitling, which is for deaf and hard of hearing viewers. It covers audio description, which helps blind viewers to enjoy visual entertainment. And visual can also mean not only TV and broadcast and theatrical, but in a wider sense, museums and exhibitions, which we don't particularly deal with, but just to give you an idea. Um, Access Services also encompasses sign language, uh, again for deaf, uh, deaf viewers, and it also uh, involves translation, which isn't necessarily for uh, any uh, less capable viewers, but it forms a big part of what we do as well, so translation into different languages of subtitles uh, plays a big role in Access Services. How many languages and language combinations are you currently working with? That's a really tough question because in subtitling we do dozens and dozens of languages, more, more than I can actually number. I wish I had the number for you now. I can tell you that my speciality within SDI is audio description and in audio description we have experience in... I'm going to name each language so I can count them properly. So we have experience in English, French, German, Swedish, Danish, Norwegian, Polish and Spanish. So that's eight languages we have experience in audio description with. How does audio description work from your point of view? You receive the product and then you send back the result to the client. Yeah, so we it's, it's a workflow that's actually been adapted over the last three years since I've worked here. But because as we found out what was more efficient and what started to work better, we developed it work, the, the workflow to, to make it more efficient. So at the beginning, we started with our freelancers, script writers, coming into the office and using our software to write the scripts. Then we would have them voiced. Um, depending on what language, if it was a foreign language, we would still, we always have the English script written, then we get the script translated, then we get it voiced in the target language. So we would have our freelancers come into the office to write the script. We would send it off to our translators who we trained, I, I trained in, in uh, various locations, and then we would have it voiced in our local studios. Um, we started to get so much work that we needed to keep up with the demand and one way to do that was we developed our own software or rather adapted our own software. The software is called GTS and we have always used this in, in our own company for subtitling purposes. We were able to, our IT team were able to adapt it so that we were now able to write audio description scripts on it. This was probably one of the biggest changes to our workflow because it enabled our freelancers to then write scripts from home where, or wherever they were, on a beach somewhere in Thailand, which some people had done. <laughs> um, so this allowed, rather than three people coming into the office at any one time, which is how many licenses of the software we had, GTS, we were able to provide our freelancers for free and as many as they want. So we then had uh, the capability for 10 script writers to write scripts all at the same time, which you can imagine really improved the amount that we were able to produce on a daily and weekly basis. So what typically happens now is if it's English, we'll still have it written in GTS, wherever the guy or girl is, um, and then they'll come into the office, we'll resave the file so it's adaptable to our software because the the Significant thing is that GTS can't record AD, it can only write. So we still have to record in these premises, in our local studios. So the writer will write the script and then come into the office and record the audio description uh, here. If it's a foreign language, which it mostly is, what we deal with, then we'll still write it in GTS. We'll, we'll use FTP and uh, secure sharing facilities to allow the translator to download the English script. They'll 
translate it into their own language, and then we'll send it off to our local studio and it will be recorded there. So in simple terms, that's the typical workflow. We receive the material from the client, the video, of course, and usually the dialogue script as well, which helps with the creative side of writing it. Then we'll do this work, uh, this, uh, work process, which I just explained, between the writers, translators, and voiceovers. Once, it, once it's recorded, it's mixed by a designated team in, in our media hub in Poland, and then it's sent to the client. So that's a basic overview of how it's produced. And uh, for the last three years, how have you been capable of streamlining the production of audio description? Was it very primitive at the beginning, and now that you have the software and the right people, it's much, much faster, you would say? We, we always had the right people because I, my, my freelancers, the, it always goes back to the script writers because they, in this whole process, they are the most experienced and most knowledgeable in audio description. So they're a mix of, of people who are some of the most experienced audio describers in this country and then people who maybe studied at university or had a little bit of knowledge on it and then uh, people who I trained up. So with the people that I trained up, those are the ones that I needed to spend a bit more time on because I... You know, I always started them on, let's say, fairly easy programs, developed them, sat with them after each episode they wrote, make sure they were on the right track, uh, developed them until they got to a level where I was comfortable to give them any piece of work they could do. I believe you spoke to one of my freelancers who was in this exact position, mm -hmm. uh, Heather, Heather, and she, she really started right at the, at the bottom, as it were. Um, and is now at a level where I'm confident I can give her any piece of work, no matter how difficult to audio describe, because um, you know she's she's developed that much. And it, it's not a quick process. It took um, you know it takes months to train, in my eyes, to train people properly for audio description. Heather mentioned that you supervised her work. Uh, how do you supervise um, a script, and how do you supervise the voice recordings? Now, it, it's, it's more of a... See, Heather's a good example to use because in the early stages of training her, I would sit with her after every single episode to make sure that we picked apart everything she was writing. Now that it's, she's at an excellent level, I don't feel the need to check her work every single episode. It's just not necessary because she's much better than that now. So... That, that goes for all the freelancers. When I'm confident in their skills, I check their work from time to time. And that goes with everyone from the whole process. I, it's, it is impossible for me as one person just to check every single person's work because I'd have no time to do anything else. So um, it's a typical thing where I, I generally trust what the freelancers in each layer are doing, translation and voiceovers included. And from time to time, I'll just check their work. And if I see things that I need to pick out, for example, I tell voiceovers, slow down a bit, make sure your tone is a little bit clearer. Translators, you know, you need to cut down a little bit of what you're saying because this is not helping the voiceover very much. Stuff like that is things that I'll generally pick out, but it's more of an occasional uh, quality check these days. For the bulk of the work, if we have a theatrical project, then then. I will usually um, listen to the recordings that have been recorded each one, or I might even use one of my freelancers to get a second pair of eyes, so to speak. That's perfect, Shaq. We'll continue in conversation with you in a moment. Thank you. So, Shaq, we are in a different environment, and now it's time to discuss the technical side of how audio description is made. The last time you did an audio description, what was your role, and what were the difficulties that you encountered? The last time we did audio description was for a German series and my role as ever was to supervise the workflow of this so um, as we might have discussed before it was the English script that was written then it was translated into German and then it was voiced in German and it was voiced right here in this studio. I would say the main issues really came with well, I wouldn't really call them problems as such. It was more that we um, we used a voiceover who uh, hadn't done audio description before. So although it's very easy to 
to learn the software, you do have to adapt your thinking a little bit. If you come from a different background, let's say acting or or commercial voiceover or dubbing, etc., then you do have to retune your thinking a little bit to get into the frame of mind of um, narrating audio description, storytelling. So I wouldn't really call them problems, but it was more uh, training his thinking a little bit. And th there were there were just uh, certain elements like I wanted to, um, him to slow down at certain points um, to to think about the content that he was watching. I think that's an important point because I, I, I believe, well, some people think that in audio description you should be completely robotic and monotonous and speak in one voice. And I've heard audio description like that. I personally don't really feel that comfortable with it. And what I will tell my voiceovers is I don't want you to overact. I don't want you to be over the top, but I do think it's important that you have a little bit of light and shade and you think about the content that you're watching and adapt your voice accordingly. So there were just uh, a few a few bits of tinkering that we needed to do um, with certain descriptions just to say, feel the content a bit more. Maybe change your tone a little bit. Maybe take a little bit of a bigger gap between that particular sentence because the scene is quite slow and you're sounding a little bit fast. So maybe just um, slow down your overall speed a little bit. These were these were the main elements that I I dealt with and supervised in our last project. Would you say that there are limitations in the type of vocabulary that is used? And uh, if that were the case, that they vary from genre to genre. I wouldn't say there are limitations with vocabulary. I I encourage voiceovers to be creative. Again, not over the top. It should always be in a language that is understandable. Um, language meaning whatever language you're speaking. Uh, the yeah, the vocabulary should be understandable and easy to digest and easy to consume. Uh, limitations in the sense of you should be considerate of what genre you are writing for. So. If it's uh, if you're describing an animated series for children under 10 years old, then of course you're not going to use the same kind of vocabulary that you would for a drama that's aimed at 30 to 40 year olds. Of course you uh, have to make sure that your language is appropriate. Just like we're saying the voiceover should feel the content in the tone of his voice or her voice, the writer should feel the content in the type of words that they use. So... In that way, you could say there are limitations, but in the sense of is the writer constricted with a certain amount of words, no, they should they should have creative freedom. And uh, what about receiving products aimed at children? Uh, can every audio describer adapt to that sort of content? Every audio describer has the ability to adapt to that sort of content but again one of the first points i mentioned was you know retraining voiceovers perhaps if they haven't done ad before well writing ad for children is another skill set really it's not it's not wildly different of course not because you're still doing the same thing but you do have to retrain your thinking a little bit if you've been used to writing uh dramas and adult content for the last 10 years and you haven't done a children's series in five years then it's probably quite natural that certain words or vocabulary are going to slip in because you're maybe used to certain phraseology or certain vocabulary that you use so um, you you would have to retrain yourself a little bit or at least after you've written it go over it and say to yourself does every description fit with the tone of what the program is is giving um, so it is a little bit of a different skill in a way you have to make sure that you are talking to your audience in the appropriate manner and uh, what has been your personal experience with audio description and the media in general have you seen it changed have you seen it uh, perhaps plateau over the last few years I've seen change I've been with audio description I've been with SDI media for three and a half years now and the biggest change I've seen is the amount of languages that are being requested. So th we we have always uh, featured Scandinavian audio description, which seems to be, in my opinion, in Europe, 
a little bit further along than some of the other European languages. But we have seen an increase in in more languages being added. So, for example, in the last two years, we have done French and German audio description for the very first time. Before that, we were not asked about it. Maybe we were asked about it because the certain customers were being told by Ofcom that this is coming, so they wanted to get an idea of um, how this is done and who's providing it. Uh, but I would say that's the biggest change. And also, not just in foreign languages, but the the volume in English as well. It you know it might be surprising to some people that in the UK, which I think is probably the most advanced country regarding audio description and transmitting audio description broadcasts, um, the major broadcasters in the UK are required to broadcast 10% of their content annually, which is audio described. They actually all do a minimum of 20, some even more. Uh, one channel, two years ago, um, they they broadcast over 50% of audio described content across the year, which is a, a massive amount, considering that they are only required to do 10. So in that way, I, I think there are clear signs that audio description is growing in English and in other languages, uh, particularly in Europe. And as a service provider, an accessibility services provider, how are you affected by new regulations or by changes in those regulations? You mentioned Ofcom earlier. The changes are more applicable to our customers because they are the ones essentially who need to broadcast this output. We are able to provide the service for them. So the the change really comes from them being told that they have to do more and in turn, us doing a little bit more for them. If these changes affect the customer, then uh, what's your reaction? Do you adapt to their preferences or do you um, have an economic impact and that's that? Our, our reaction is to just keep up with the demand and keep a high level of quality. Um, the, there's also there's also a reaction in that when we get requested for a new language, of course, we have to have the people to do it. So a big part of my role ever since I've been here is really to find resources who can help us um, fulfill the needs of our customers. So if we get requested a new language, like German, for example, well, I, I didn't know anybody who could do German uh, audio description at the beginning. I did eventually find uh, a couple of translators, but um, what I also then went out looking for voiceovers. A voiceovers is much easier because you don't have to have... The, the, with the translators, you have to have linguistic knowledge. Um, a voiceover is always going to have linguistic knowledge, but the translators have to have a, a certain type of linguistic knowledge. They have to be skilled in translating, in subtitling, for example, which at least is a base for them to be able to develop their skills in audio description. So that's the harder part. The easier part is finding the voiceovers. We just have to teach them how to use the software and read it in the appropriate tone. But so I would just say our reaction is just to keep up with the demand and find good people who can help us do the work. And finally, what would you say is the greatest challenge that is coming? The greatest challenge is probably finding people to do the work. Um, because the thing is that although audio description is growing, and it is growing across Europe, it, it's still so small. It's a really small thing. We can all agree that subtitling is the main form of accessibility. And my, you and myself were discussing earlier that even people who aren't deaf use subtitles. It's a very, very common accessibility. And we see that levels of subtitling for broadcasters are 80, 90, 100%. So, the, you know, one of the biggest challenges really is when we get asked to do a new language to to find those good people who can help us do it and to retrain them in what they have learned. If they're a subtitler for 15 years, they can, of course, transfer some of those skills over to audio description, but they do have to learn new skills to do AD. And 
as I said, it's it's growing, but it's still very small in the European languages. So I think that organizations and companies like ourselves, it, it is a good thing for us to work together and to communicate with each other to to get these people in place, maybe um, come up with training programs or certain formulas in the way that people should learn audio description so that everyone who's learning and there will be a lot more in the next few years. Everyone who's learning is learning in in an appropriate and, and in a good way. Shaq Yusuf, thank you for having us today. Thank you for speaking to us.